Hey everybody, Mr. Dustin here, and I hope you're having a good day so far. And welcome to Bible class. I'm glad that you're here. Today, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever played baseball? How many people does it take to play baseball? Like a full game of baseball, not just like if somebody's throwing the ball and somebody's doing batting practice, but like really playing baseball. Just one, two, maybe closer to ten, right? What are all the different positions? Do you know? I mean, you have the left fielder, the center fielder, the right fielder, first, second, third baseman, shortstop, pitcher, catcher. All these people that it takes for one team, and then the other team has a batter, right? And you have all these people that it takes to play a team. Which position is most important? It's kind of a trick question. They're all important. You have to have each to play. In fact, I don't think in, like if you ever watch real live baseball on TV, they won't even let you play if you don't have all the positions covered. They're all important. So I want you to think about that, and I, I, want to, I want to get you to read a passage real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 through 27. I want you to read that with your family. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 through 27. Read that, and then I want to talk to you a little bit more. So what does that passage tell us about the church? We're all one, right? We are all one body, and we are all important parts of the body. You can't say to the hand, I don't need you, or whatever. All of the parts are important, but they're all also different. They don't all have the same purpose. Now, we've been studying about heroes of the church. You probably remember that recently. And now we're studying kind of about Paul and what he was teaching. Um, there's no real one-size-fits-all definition of who is a hero and who are the servants in the church. Each person is different. And just like the baseball team, we have to have the different players to fill the different roles within the church that are needed. So everybody that's included has all kinds of different talents and gifts. Think about Paul. Not everybody's going to be this really strong powerhouse preacher and missionary evangelist like Paul. That's a good thing. We need other people. We need people who can stay in a local church instead of just go be missionaries somewhere else because if everybody was leaving and going somewhere else, it wouldn't work. But it can be easy for us to think that somebody's job is more important than others, and that's not necessarily the case. Everybody has a job to do, and it's important within the kingdom, within the gospel, and within the church. So today... We're going to talk about one of those roles, one of those jobs that some people have that not everybody has but is very important. And that is the gift of encouragement. There's a specific person that I'm thinking of who had the gift of encouragement. Do you know who it is? I bet you do. It's a man that we know as Barnabas. But I want to read, if you have your Bible, I hope you do, you're supposed to have read 1 Corinthians 12 that you will turn over to Acts chapter 4 with me. We're going to read chapter 4, verse 36 and 37. And this is, this is where we get introduced to Barnabas. Chapter 4, 36 and 37. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. What was his real name? His real name is Joseph. But what did they call him? Barnabas. Why Barnabas? It says that he was a son of encouragement. So they nicknamed him Barnabas because he was such an encourager. Now, let me ask you, when you hear the word encouragement, what do you think of? What comes to mind? And maybe, what actions or activities can you come up with that would fit under this idea of encouragement? I want you to take just a minute and talk about that with your family. What do you think of whenever you hear the word encouragement? And then, what are things that you can do that are encouraging to other people? 
and then we'll come back and we'll talk some more. It's interesting to see just these two verses that tell us about Joseph, who they call Barnabas. It says that he, he sold a field. He took the, the money that he earned off of the sale of that field, laid it at the apostles' feet. He gave a huge gift so that the apostles could distribute it. And if you read in verse 34, it says, There were no needy persons among them, for from time to time those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Barnabas, Joseph, was one of those people that was freely willing to sell his own land and give it to others that they would have need. That would be encouraging. Just by reading these few verses, I think you can really see why they would call him a son of encouragement. Uh, have you ever been in need? Or even, have you known somebody that was in need? In my experience, it is very humbling whenever somebody wants to come and give something to you to help you whenever you are in need. And it's also very encouraging. Uh, when, when someone comes face to face with the love of Christ by another person bringing to them what they need, the encouragement is so great from that. We have personally experienced that kind of thing. Uh, it's been a long time and it's a long story and I won't necessarily tell you now, but I remember very clearly somebody providing for my physical needs and I was so encouraged by it because I didn't know what I was gonna do. So I know just from reading this story about Barnabas it is so encouraging whenever somebody gives of their finances to help you. And I think that has a lot to do with why we see Barnabas as being called a son of encouragement. It's also worth, worth noting that Barnabas, just by having a generous and a kind heart, he made a huge difference in the lives of the people in the church. And it wasn't through a sermon or a, or a lesson that he preached or spoke. His example, his actions, the things that he did were such a great example that we should also follow. So I want to read another, another passage. This is, this is getting us a little bit further in, in time here. And this is important. This is from chapter 9. Verse 1 through 3. It's important to remember who this man is. Chapter 9, verse 1 through 3. Meanwhile, Saul, remember who Saul is? Listen to this. Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. That's whenever Saul had a very unique experience. But it's important that we remember who this man is, Saul, because he was the one who was approving of the stoning of Stephen, if you remember that. He was arresting people. He was bringing them back to the high priest. He was tormenting people in the churches. Let me ask you, if you knew who this man was today, if there was somebody that was going around and arresting Christians and persecuting them and stoning them and approving of it, would you be a little worried about meeting that person? I know I would be. I don't really get excited about the idea of physical pain and people hurting me just because I'm a Christian. It kind of scares me a little bit. Let's keep reading about Saul, though, and see what happens. So this is uh, chapter 9, verse 4 through 19. Again, this is a scary guy. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. 
Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias! Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. Ananias sounds a little afraid, just kind of like I would be. I'd be nervous to go meet this guy. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may, be, may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. What happened there? Just kind of review that story. But I think it's very clear to see we just witnessed Saul's conversion. He went from, you might almost call him evil, this bad guy that was scary, somebody that you'd be afraid of if you were a Christian because he was persecuting and arresting and torturing, to being a Christian himself. It's really quite a remarkable story. But can't you see that if you were a Christian being threatened by Saul and persecuted by Saul, that it would be hard for you to, to switch gears over to, no, 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 he's a good guy. He's, he's nice now that he has a new mission. Um, or do you think it would be hard? Do you think it would be easy to believe it? Or do you think it would be hard to believe it? Personally, I would be skeptical of his change, of his shift of gears. But I want, to, I want to keep reading a little bit. This is following in chapter 9 and see what happens because I think it tells us a little bit about what's going on in the church. So this is in chapter 9, verse 20. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus at once. He began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't this the same man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. Why were the people so astonished? Do you have any idea? I think it's safe to say that it wasn't very long before that he was breathing out these murderous threats against the church, against those that believed the very thing he is now preaching. And so the Jews, they conspired to kill him. That's kind of scary. That's a big deal. Well, what does this have to do with Barnabas? I thought we were talking about Barnabas, a son of encouragement. Well, it's important to remember this because of what happens next. Let's look at the next few verses. This comes in chapter 9, verse 26 through 31. 
let's see what happens here. When he came to Jerusalem, that's Saul, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. Remember, I said earlier, I would be afraid, and these people, they're afraid of him too. They're not so sure that this is genuine. But verse 27, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. When the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened, living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. But Barnabas, right? The people, they were afraid of Saul. They didn't really believe what happened was true. But Barnabas, what did he do? Would that have made a big difference to you? If people were scared of you and they were avoiding you, didn't believe you, and there was a man that said, no, 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 he's good. I promise, I've heard, I've seen how would you feel if that was you? I feel like I would be very, very encouraged by that. Barnabas was not afraid of Saul. He chose to see the best in Saul. And it says that he took Saul, now that we really call him Paul, uh, and he brought him to the disciples. He acted as a friend to Saul, maybe as a liaison which is a fancy word for like a, like a bridge, somebody who's a, a go-between, uh, between Saul and those other disciples. I think that would take a lot of courage and a very kind heart. In a very real sense, it's a heart like Jesus that chooses to believe and see the best in other people. He then took the time to tell the disciples what had happened to Saul, how he'd been changed on the road to Damascus and how in Damascus he'd been preaching that these things really did happen. So again, I want to stop and point out something important. Did Barnabas prepare a lesson and get his notes together and, and go and preach this really powerful gospel sermon? No, not really. What did he do? He helped change things in this relationship for the disciples between Paul and and those disciples for the better. And aren't we thankful for his gift of encouragement and of kindness? We all know the rest of the story of Paul, how he becomes this amazing evangelist and preacher so dedicated to the cause of Christ. But what would have happened if Barnabas had not been there, if he had not brought him in to, to be with the disciples in Jerusalem, if he hadn't been there to fill that gap, what would have happened? How would that story be different? Now, do you remember the beginning of our discussion about a baseball team at the beginning of class? When the whole group of that baseball team brings their talents together, that is when they are the most effective everybody working for the same goal, but with their unique abilities. Barnabas used his gift of generosity by giving of his money to the church, but he also used his talent of being a sort of bridge builder, an encourager to help other people see who Saul really had become. Maybe you have experienced sadness or discouragement. Maybe you haven't been included by a group of people, especially ones that you wanted to be friends with. 
It's in times like this that we all so desperately need a Barnabas, an encourager. So not only can we provide encouragement to others, but they can provide encouragement to us. And something that I like about songs, songs are also very encouraging. Music, for me, has been very encouraging in some of my biggest challenges. And so that, I think, is one of many reasons that at church we sing songs together, because they're encouraging to us. Also, the words to them are very important to us and encouraging to us. And so there are many songs that we sing. They not only praise God, but they also encourage us as we all sing to one another. So I've got a couple of songs that I want to sing with you um, that, that I will sing together and then we'll be done for Bible class. But I just want you to remember to be a Barnabas. Be an encourager. Find a way to encourage other people because we all need encouragement. Let's sing these two songs together. The first one is called, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. If you have your blue songbook from church, it's number 800. If not, that's okay. You can probably just sing along with me. We'll sing that together now. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Oh, because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. The next one that we'll sing is number 31, Be Still and Know. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. Thank you for coming to Bible class today. I hope it has been an encouragement for you. I know it has for me. Always studying God's Word makes me feel better. And I know that singing these songs always makes me feel better. So we'll sing the second verse of Be Still and Know, and I'll see you next time. I am the Lord that strengthens thee. I am the Lord that strengthens thee. I am the Lord that strengthens me. I'll see you next time. Have a good week.